Can I have your attention please? Have we been running a little bit behind club all day? We've now managed to catch ourselves up and being very conscious of the fact that many people are needing to go... Are you not able to hear you, Richard? Um, okay. Um, very conscious that people are needing to get away to catch trains. So if I can ask our friends over here to join us. Um, we are going to go straight into our final session. Um, and I'm absolutely thrilled about our final speaker. Delighted that he's able to be with us. It's a real privilege. Um, many of you I know, or some, certainly some of you, will already have seen um, Sam speaking on YouTube and no doubt elsewhere. I'm going to keep the introduction fairly short. So Sam, come in I've got the name right, um, is a serial social entrepreneur, and I think as he just put it to me, a comrade in arms, in our work in social action and working with um, communities on the edge, perhaps I would say. And that's all I'm going to say, because I can't wait to hear more about how to be more pirate. spaces. Uh, the youth sector has really been my principal area of involvement um, and the biggest projects we've run have been things like Liberty and Live Magazine and Somewhere Too. Uh, they've taken me all over the country working with all sorts of young people from all different backgrounds and I've been thoroughly dedicated to the pursuit of giving young people opportunities to step through the doors that usually aren't open to them. My principal objective around this has been not just to stay within the sector but to broaden it out uh, and routinely I've been knocking on the doors of big business to try and unlock funding that doesn't usually get directed towards young people to help them, it usually gets directed towards young people to sell stuff to them. And more often than not, sell stuff they don't need. And often I found that that can be deeply problematic because it can go directly against the things that they do need and much of the good work that we try to do. Um, I couldn't have found this more acutely realised in the world of marketing, so my main principal social enterprise uh, set out to steal the clothes of marketing. We look very much like a marketing agency to our clients, that's where our income comes from. But the office is uh, informed and in fact inhabited by hundreds of young people every single day. And they take the real legitimate opportunity to work with big brands that range from Netflix to PlayStation to actually really give them a lift. The transformation engine is my favourite description of the work that we do. And that's the way the young people have described us. I set this up when I was 23 in the middle of Brixton, um, uh, really to, to challenge the kind of equality that I'd faced as a young person, um, but more so my friends. And uh, I'd always said that when I hit 40, I would leave. Because when I was 23, 40 felt like it would never happen. Um, and I, think, I thought that it would be inauthentic for me to leave such a profoundly youth led program um, myself. I was 40 last year, it turned out it wasn't a joke. Uh, my colleagues were waiting for me to elegantly depart because I'd said it one too many times. Um, and so we raised some social investments uh, and so I could hand over to a new team and also so I could lock in the purpose of the business and I stepped aside. Um, and I was wrapped in a huge identity crisis for 20 years. This has been my mission um, uh, and I really didn't know what was going to happen next. And so I started writing a book, partly because I'm dyslexic. Um, partly because I never went to university myself and I have a big chip on my shoulder about that. And partly because I needed a space to shout everything that I really angrily believed in, uh, knowing that it'd be safe because no one would ever listen. <laughs> um, and also because, I'll be really honest to you, I was frustrated after 20 years, still in Brixton, still looking out in the same group of young people, and if anything, it's got worse. You know, there's you know, successive strategies with different names have under-delivered. Um, 
consecutive senior government that's brought us in and, and, and not had a strategy. Um, and the challenges facing the young people I care most about have not disappeared. Um, and while some has been improvements, overall, I have to question our success. How can I not? 20 years is a long time. So, all of this flowed into the pages of this book, which I will now tell you the story of. Uh, or perhaps I won't. Oh, that's unfortunate. Hold on for me one second. So, a technical challenge live stream. Stay with us live stream. I hear that the Wi Fi has been patchy. Yeah, it's what's just called me out as well. There's my phone. Okay, we're back. Maybe. No, we're not. Oh well, you're just going to have to bear with me. The book is dedicated to my daughter. She's five and a half years old. She's called Scarlet. Um, and she pointed out, rightly, uh, Daddy, how on earth did you manage to write a book about pirates without there being any pictures in it? It was an astute observation that only a five and a half year old could make. So she asked me what it's about. And I said, I think it's about breaking the rules. So I think where we stand and the future that I'm most interested in for you, I'm really failing to continue to have any confidence that the rules that we've been given, that we've inherited, in fact, the way things have been, is any indication as to the way things should be. I can't see any way of getting forward and perhaps, you know, you inheriting the world that you deserve by me following the way things have been for the last 20 years. I think it's time for some professional rule breaking. See, that went a little bit over my head. Um, but I'm passionate about this. And I got a call at the end of the week. In fact, my wife got a call, which is more troublesome because my wife's Mexican, uh, from the deputy principal saying, what's happened to Scarlett? She's breaking all the rules. She's just throwing stuff on the floor. The jacket and all sorts of things. So I was duly uh, charged with writing this wrong. And I took, as we previous slide would have showed us, a picture of the Militant Forces statue. I took my daughter up to Parliament Square, looked down May. In June, the statue was unveiled, and I told her the story of Millicent Fawcett, a woman who fought for the rights that my daughter will enjoy, who in her time was breaking all the rules, who put her neck on the line, who put her life on the line, who risked everything she had to break the rules because she knew that in the moment she was in, doing the wrong thing was doing the right thing. And that's a really hard judgment to make. And that story stayed with Scarlett. She asked the story of the other statues, because we were in Parliament Square by that point. And those that I can remember with my limited GCC history are all there because they broke rules. So even right outside our greatest institution of power, we recognise in some way that our legends, our heroes, are those who challenge the status quo, not those who followed it. And we don't make statues for those who just follow orders. In fact, history judges that as a rather problematic decision. And I think it's like painters, like Picasso, who argues that every great act of creativity begins with an act of destruction, that we fail to recognise rule breakers for their art in the time that they are in. But really, that's what it is. And those of us who feel the frustrations of trying desperately to change the world within the rules that we've inherited begin to draw the conclusion, or certainly I have, that actually we're only going to get close to the kind of change that's required, or even change that's moving as fast as the disruption that's taking place outside these walls, if we step outside the permission-based change that we've allowed. We know where permission-based change goes. I've got a great idea. Brilliant. Put it in a PowerPoint slide so that I can kill it in an email for <laughs> Professional rule breaking, where we step outside of the rules, create new rules ourselves, and risk them, is judged by one main metric, which is nearly getting fired once a year. If you're nearly getting fired once a year by uh, bringing your new rules into the space, then I would imagine you're probably closer to the kind of innovation that's going to take place under the usual rules of permission based change. That's my theory, anyway, and I'll, I'll tell you how I got there. Um, because it seems that the kind of rules that need challenging are in no short supply. This slide won't demonstrate because the pictures aren't there, but nonetheless, <laughs> normal this one, and normal that one. <laughs> oh, fuck it. This isn't going to work at all. <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 it's exactly. Oh, the, the beautiful irony of that, hey. Should we give it another chance? You can see it better than that way. But look, I've, spent, I've been sitting on the train making beautiful slides for you. If it doesn't work, I'm going to sulk. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. 
And I've arrived in this exact same space, right? What have we got to do? Maybe, as you know, Term 42, we've made this award-winning social enterprise. And our clients range from Netflix to Facebook. We're working on issues that range from uh, ex radical extremism to domestic violence. And still, I'm totally frustrated by what I've got, because what I've inherited is a political paralysis or a series of business leaders without the balls to really do the right thing, and not just a positioning purpose thing. You know, the biggest challenges that I look out to, what are my leaders to really make a difference? A couple of Donald Trump memes, you know, it's, it's not good enough. I don't, I don't see that I've got the chances to make the change that I think are necessarily required. And my, my interest, even though I've left Liberty, is still very much working with young entrepreneurs, particularly young social entrepreneurs. I founded a network that works across uh, several European hubs, another international one that's taken me all around the world, from Africa to America, uh, another group that's particularly about the reverse diaspora um, of entrepreneurs going back to Athens to help pick up, prop up a failing economy there. And I'm just so frustrated at the benchmarks of innovations that we have for those kind of young leaders. You know, the over-deference to Silicon Valley and, and the singular idea that all good innovation is, is that actually, you know, Horseshit trotting out behind so many of the unicorns that we over aggrandize and fail to look to real innovation, which is taking place at the intersection of the social challenges we face, looking at different models to address them. We are so confused as to where the answers can really lie. And this frustrates the hell out of me. This lack of leadership, in fact, I think this vacuum of leadership, the vacuum of imagination of leadership. Uh, you will know this feeling, as I have, as I went through my journey of becoming a social entrepreneur. I was made a social enterprise ambassador. We routinely get invited to number 10. And, and I kept going because I kept expecting one day to meet the grown-ups who've got a plan. I kept expecting that somewhere under the stairs at number 10, there's like a secret gang of civil servant ninjas who really do have a master plan of all of this stuff. Uh, I keep becoming a bit disappointed that really, you know, it's just not there. We went from a non-strategy to a kind of Oxford oligarchy to a total disaster. You know, they couldn't be clearer right now. And I've felt the same in, in the corporate world. Every time I've got near, you know, what themed like really visionary business leaders stepping into the transformative, sustainable new model of business space, I still haven't yet come across the kind of consensual ideas that we need that are at scale of anywhere near the challenges we face. And so here I am, under delivery to the young people who I believe are the answers. Here I am, inspired more by the young people who are fighting hard at the edges than I am by the leaders that we've got. And here I am, convinced that there needs to be some kind of better understanding of how we got into this mess and some of the, the, the lessons of history as we look to our future. And so, I tried to find a set of role models that would fit the hour. A set of role models that could be up there alongside the civil rights movement, or perhaps the suffragettes, you know, when there were ideas truly worth fighting for, putting your neck on the line for, that my daughter can look up to, that aren't us fanning about with the, you know, important and well-meant, but ultimately distracting notions of you know, palm oil to gender, in, uh, to, to, to the diversity debate, to identity politics, when really it's the erosion of our democracy and the protection of our planet that we need to fight for. And then I thought I found them. Suddenly in the golden age of pirates. These could be the role models for our app. <laughs> Slight wave of cynicism. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was talking about the suffragettes and the civil rights movement. <laughs> Did I miss something? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make sense about slides, but I'll take you there. I'll take you there. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. On a spectrum between the civil rights movement and the suffragettes, are missing. That in their time, they were better understood, more truly understood, as working class heroes and social innovators. And that part of history has been lost to all of us, because it was written out of the history books deliberately by the establishment that they challenged. This is the true story of pirates that I have found, and I'd like to make a case in the next seven or so minutes with a little bit of pirate history before bringing it back to the lessons I think it has today, if you'd be so kind. Some of my real pirate role models, some of the guys and girls that I think really truly deserve to be considered up amongst the greats of all time of standing up for equality, fairness, justice, and the kind of values that I know we all believe in. First up would be Black Sam Bellamy. Age 28, he was known as the Prince of Pirates. He was the first billionaire of all the pirates, rich for stealing the already stolen Spanish gold. But it wasn't the infamy of his thievery that made him so successful. It was his articulate and eloquent execution of the argument against the unfair, corrupt status quo and his advocation of justice, rights, and liberty for the ordinary working man and woman on board the ships. Or there was Edward Teach, more famously known as Blackbeard. 
famous for his uh, brand of piracy, really the archetype of the entire pirate brand as we know it. So dedicated was Blackbeard to living this brand that he would set light to fuses at the end of his beard and hair to create this flaming vision of furious hell as he bore down on his victims. But he did so not because he was a psychopath, he liked saying light to himself. He did so because actually there is no historical record of Blackbeard killing anyone. And like most of the pirates, he was some of the least violent crews on any of the ships at the time. Certainly far less violent than the Royal Navy, the Merchant Navy, the East India Company, or any of those guys who were the true bastards. Or we could take Black Caesar, who was one of many black pirates. In fact, the pirates 120 years before the beginning of the fight for the abolition of slavery in America were regularly releasing slaves, not just releasing slaves, but inviting them into their community with equal rights. Equal rights that were not yet seen for another century anywhere in the world. And the same goes for Anne Bonny, my favourite of all the pirate stories. It's the best pirate tale. If you've got time afterwards, I'll tell you the whole story. But she represented the notion of gender equality, which also took place uniquely on board pirate ships. She was one of the very few female pirate captains and leaders, demonstrating that the only place in the world at the time where women were given respect for their equal capacity and intelligence in a position of leadership was underneath the scar and crossbones on a pirate ship. 150 years before the fight for suffrage began in the UK. These are the kind of figureheads I'm talking about. These are the kind of stories that are lost, that are never seen in the pirates of the Caribbean. And of course, I know the image that we all grew up with. It's a kind of camp, Captain Hook, Jack Sparrow, kind of weird, sexy pirate story. I mean, it's confusing, right? They're, they're, the, only, they're the only kind of murderous rogues of history who have this kind of lovable place in our hearts. My daughter went to a five-year-old uh, pirate party the other day. It was perfectly normal. I mean, when else would that happen? Has anyone's children ever been invited to a Pablo Escobar party? It's, this just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. But pirates have this unique place in our hearts. It's because we kind of, there's a part of us which knows this part of the story, but most of us don't know the rest of it. So here's some genuine historical pirate facts. First up, um, uh, the notion of global branding. So most of us in business would have, uh, believe that this was born from Coca-Cola in the 1880s with their signature bottle um, that then became the solution. The logo was the, didn't make the most recognized brand on earth, but it wasn't. It was the golden age of pirates who deliberately invented the skull and crossbones to bastardize the number one communications channel at the time, which was the naval flag system. They turned it black and put skulls on it, which was against the law. They did so to demonstrate their singular message, which is the best principle of all marketing. I mean, if it was surrender or die, but we can come back to the morality of that, but nonetheless, it drove their business model, and as I've already mentioned, making them much less violent than many of the other people on the sea at the time, because there was no incentive to violence whatsoever. There was no way they could take on the odds that they did if they were risking fights every time. They had nowhere to grow cover or replenish or restore. So they were super smart marketeers. They, they used their storytelling to really further their cause and take on extraordinary odds. But it's not just branding, it's right down to how they organize their businesses. Uh, these were the first organizations on earth to instigate a written form of dual governance. So the, there was the captain, who we all know about, but then there was the quartermaster. Uh, the quartermaster had equal seniority to the captain, not widely known, but the quartermaster also had the voice of the entire crew. So one was in charge of culture, the other in charge of strategy. Giving this set of checks and balances 12 years before the Parliament Act and 20 years before the Companies Act was first ever seen. And then it goes on. This system, uh, first ever sit, written down system of workplace compensation was on board a pirate ship. If you so, it's a loser, actually, actually, wait a minute, how many of us are there? All right, this is good, this is a pirate crew. So the average size of a pirate crew was 80 people. It was completely diverse, all ages, I mean, average age was about 27, so it's slightly older than well, not that high. But on the whole, we're looking like a good pirate crew to me. So here we go, so you so, you lose legs, sorry about this. 800 pieces of eight awarded to you, and you say, lose an arm. 600 pieces of eight, and you madam puts an eye, so that's 150 pieces of eight were awarded. A system of compensation through injury in 1700. It didn't become a, a right, it was fought, a long fought for uh, law, and then eventually an able human right. But the list goes on. Universal suffrage. Every single person on board a pirate ship had a uh, representative vote regardless of gender, ethnicity, or background. So it was more representative democracy than even Athenian democracy, where, of course, only the white folks had a vote. Um, there was no gender pay gap on board pirate ship because there was no pay gap on board pirate ship. Everybody was paid equally. And similar to some of our organizations, there was a higher and lower yield. So you couldn't, you couldn't increase the highest amount without increasing the lowest amount. There was a form of halacracy, uh, where self-organizing teams op operated in non-hierarchical systems. 
there was true diversity. The average diversity on border partnership was 40% people of colour. I mean, there were many innovations and narratives that were taking place that most of our businesses can't keep pace with. And it wasn't just in the way that they were organised. It was much broader than that. On border partnerships, there was the first ever written form of same-sex marriage. So sophisticated, even had an inheritance clause. And if the organisational stuff isn't doing it for you, the pirates were the first people to invent the cocktail. <laughs> You would win you over there, it's Friday afternoon after all. Um, yes, Sir Francis Drake invented a drink which was rum, lime, sugar, mint. It's a mojito without the ice. And a border ship in the middle of the Caribbean will forgive you for not having the ice. This is all true. True facts. Moments of real social innovation that, that's similar perhaps to the dawn of Silicon Valley or, or the 19th century with all its radars and light bulbs. And, or maybe even the Second World War, you know, when, when humanity is up against great odds tend to innovate. And that was the essential role of pirates. The, the line I got from one of the pirate economists that I found, amongst the many discoveries, was that there were such a thing as pirate economists. Not many, to be fair. Um, and they argue the absolutely essential role of pirates, the essential role of pirates. When society or business gets blocked, that pirates on the edges push things further than they can get on their own. Yes, of course we can have innovation labs and funds and whatever, but when it's still taking place under the spotlights, it's not the same as when it's in the dark, in the shadows, in the spaces that on the edges of the maps where some aren't scared to go. And in that space, creativity comes, innovation comes. If it wasn't for uh, real pirate radio, then we wouldn't have broken the monopoly of the BBC. A state-backed monopoly with two channels, as it had run for decades, and it was only when boats Prove that a third of the country wanted to listen to them and a commercial model was realised, but then modern commercial entertainment was invented. Uh, the, the original proposal for Netflix included the Pirate Bay. When Steve Jobs presented iTunes, he showed them LimeWire. You know, the biggest advances in biotechnology are taking place in pirate laboratories and people kitchens. Elon Musk doesn't patent his rocket ships because it would be a blueprint for people to pirate them. There is a role before piracy in pushing things forward when they get stuck. Steve Jobs himself says, I would rather be a pirate than join the Navy. He said that when they, Apple had its famous two-day away day when they invented the Mac Classic and they took on IBM, the Navy of its time, and transformed the future of the world, and arguably. It's the quote that sits in the front of my book, um, mainly because I put it there when I wrote the proposal, because I thought the books are supposed to have a quote on the front. Um, and then after a while, everybody just assumed I must have permission. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't mention it. <laughs> but the book's out in the USA soon, so I'm sure if I was going to get sued, it will be there. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, back to the matter at hand. So the role of pirates, right, and the justification for them, it seems to me absolutely uncertain. Because I haven't just heard it from pirate economists, I also heard it from the young pirates that I've written this book for. So, leaving liberty, I was very, very aware of the cliché that I was about to become and wanted to avoid. 40-something-year-old middle-class white man leaves agency and becomes public speaker and author. Yeah. <laughs> and clearly haven't avoided it. Um, but I really did want to avoid the, you know, the potential for patronising pontification in this book. Here's what I think and aren't I smart. And, uh, and I nearly did. I, I wrote the most boring book on earth. I wrote 20,000 words of a book called Purpose First, which was for the argument of the principles of our sector being aligned into the kind of an advanced version of conscious capitalism, uh, and that could be how we fix the world. It was a terribly boring book. <laughs> and it was, I sat down with some of the young entrepreneurs that I work with, the young innovators, and they were like, ooh, what's happened to you? <laughs> ooh, what's this? Uh, and they were like, and literally, this young man said to me, where's all the pirates gone? Where's your usual hand waving and stuff? And I went back to my desk and I wrote, where's all the pirates gone? And thus the thought came into this book. Um, and it was two weeks after that, I'd down to the Greenwich uh, Maritime Museum, and then I started discovering this, this history, this history which made an analogy that I couldn't escape. The average age of pirates was in their mid-twenties. They faced an outlook which wasn't dissimilar. An international, interconnected backdrop of conflict that was so confusing no one knew which was right or wrong anymore. A, a divided society, a self-interested and short-term establishment that really only had its own future, and absolutely locked out of their own future opportunities. So then you see the notion setting out on board ships to create new societies and a new social contract as perhaps something really worth considering. And if there is to be a degree of leadership from the edges, from those suffering, 
and perhaps that is a blueprint to work. So I became quite excited and I promised myself I would never go far in my writing without checking in with the people this book is for. And so I started to workshop it intensively from Brixton to Bradford in the UK, but also through my networks. So I workshopped it with the young social entrepreneurs of Baltimore and Illinois and Detroit and Chicago, you know, cities that feel like war zones, was only when I was there, in Soweto, in Mamelodi, in, in, in Johannesburg, in the townships of South Africa, back to Athens and back to the UK. Every opportunity I could to put this idea in front of some of the toughest young people who were really tackling the, the, the situations that even with our best efforts, or certainly I thought my best efforts, two decades on, haven't managed to well get to a better answer. And that's who the book is for. Does this analogy work? You know, can this notion of modern pirates you know, really fulfill what the, the original classic golden age of pirates did? And I hope so, I think so. I've, I've created this framework at the center of the book. It's kind of five stages of, of how it can be done. And the first principle is, is one of rebellion. You know, the simple act of rebellion and how we are so absolutely hardwired to do what we're told and to follow the orders. But actually, we have some examples of rebellion it can be some of the most exploring that we found. I created this framework and I laid it down. I started looking around my current, current crop of young people, and Malala was the first to arise you know, for her simple act of rebellion. This incredible icon, always presented as a young woman against you know, the incredible odds that she faced, her act of rebellion was, was, was simple by our terms, was the writing of a blog. But in her terms, it was a life-threatening act of rebellion. I go back to my point about statues and heroes, and those who we really look up to often have put their neck on the line to do what's the wrong thing, knowing it's the right thing. The second stage is then the rewriting of rules, because the golden age of pirates, which is dissimilar to any other kind of piracy, uh, didn't just break the rules, obviously, as I've said, they rewrote them. They wrote a new social contract based on fairness and equality that wasn't seen anywhere in the world. And when I start looking at my modern pirates, this is where I find no shortage of them. My favourite example that sits uh, on my list in the book is a guy called Chance the Rapper. I don't know if you know Chance the Rapper, um, he's in his early 20s. Uh, he's the first musician on earth to win a Grammy, the highest music accolade ever. And he hasn't released a single record. He doesn't have a record contract. He doesn't have a physical piece of music. He's done it all online and all for free. His business model turns the music industry business model upside down. And because of this freedom, he's able to put millions into the Chicago healthcare system, campaign with the politicians that he believes in. He has a campaigning, creative, political freedom that no other artist has. And like that, all the millions of young people wanting to be the next big MC no longer dream of getting a record deal. Now, the rules can be rewritten. It's not necessarily only the powerful who hand us down the rules. Then there's this next principle of reorganization. From this one, I think we can all take part because the pirates couldn't operate with scale. You know, our challenges are at scale. And all of us know that very often, as soon as we've got a good answer, the next question is, but can it scale? And sometimes that's just fundamentally the wrong question. Scale is a success metric of the late 20th century when the business model was based on exploitation. There are other ways to provide solutions that can reach multitudes of audiences. And networking is how the pirates made this operate. They had small numbers. At best, they numbered around 2,000, and they were outnumbered by about 45 to 1 when you put together the Royal British Navy and the Spanish Armada. And yet, for more than a lifetime, about 35 years, the Golden Age lasts, they consistently won through their ability and power to network. These shared principles that sat across them meant that 80 person teams could combine into their force but not have to slow down with all the problems of an infrastructure that comes with scale. The paradigm is, is called the paradox of scale. And we're finding ourselves in it now that the big and big business is no longer an asset, but perhaps even a liability. And the size that we are at presents the opportunity. Next up is this notion of redistribution, the fourth of these stages. Now, I get asked several times, you know, isn't Donald Trump a pirate? Isn't Nigel Farage a pirate? And the answer is, well, the obvious, no, they're dickheads. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 and, and so many of our best heroes, so many of the rebels that we look up to or have tattoos of, you know, over time, even the, even the Mandela's as well, you know, look at where the ANC is now, you know, rebellions get sold out. The, the pirates did something very different. They baked in this level of distributed power very early on. You couldn't be on board a pirate ship if you hadn't signed in blood the pirate code, which swore you down to a principle of fairness and equality. That everybody would have equal say, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or background. That everybody would have equal pay. You were signed up to a principle of equality, fairness, liberty, justice, and democracy. 
And that had to exist. And it existed longer than the leaders because the leaders were truly accountable to their community. They made themselves uncorruptible. The big surprise of this whole story is how accountable the pirates truly were. And in this, I see so much similar in, in our world. Certainly my world of, of social enterprise and many of the best business models that I've come across. And it's exactly why I've been struggling with, with liberty the last few years before we were going to do a social investment deal. How did we protect the purpose so that any future purchaser or investor could not corrupt it? And those, those lessons aren't there in private business. They are there in our world. And finally, the fifth of these stages is the power of retelling. And this is something that we don't do very well in our sector. We don't tell our stories as well as we could or should, or certainly as well as they deserve to be told. And the pirates did. By God, they did. They told a story that was deliberately designed to go viral. They told a story that became a meme. And the entire world listened to them and was terrified of them. The, the, the waves that they caused around the world made their story so much bigger than it was. And everybody sang it. The working class sea shanties, the pirate printer that was formed, the only printer not to have a royal license, um, the, the, the dreadful penny, penny operas, the, uh, the pro-feminist literary circles of London were using only Anne Bonny as the one figurehead that they had. You know, their role, their influence was huge across all levels of culture, politics, and then eventually business. Because they told these stories so damn. The rebellion, the rewriting, the reorganization, the redistribution, the retelling constitute the five R. <laughs> and the only crappy pirate joke in the whole book, but I couldn't resist it. And it ends me up in this place. So, how do we then bring this to the now? How do we bring this power of these, these young individuals who challenged power and found a new form of power and proved that you could write a new social contract? Because they did. This story resonated around the world. After the first decade of the Golden Age of Pirates, they took their ideas off the ships and onto land. And in Nassau, on the island of the Caribbean, the epicenter of the global slave trade, which so much of industry for the next two centuries was built on, uh, and right at the dawn of the uh, industrialized capitalism, everything right at the center of it, uh, proto-democracy was formed on land where these same ideas of equality and opportunity were turned into a republic and everybody had an equal say. It mirrors directly the American constitution which followed it, and that's not a surprise because so many of the colonial governors were illicitly involved in piracy. And in fact, the pirates were held as a militia and to harry the English and uh, King James for all of the taxes that were around at the time. So there's no question in certain pirate historians' mind that there is a direct correlation between the future of American independence and the petri dish of democracy that was the pirates' republic. That's a whole other story, but a good one. Uh, but the interest for me is then, how do we take that lesson? Because we are, surely, if there was ever a moment in time where we needed a new set of rules, where perhaps legitimacy for challenging the rules that we've inherited, in fact, I sometimes think the only thing stupider than, than people following stupid rules, but the only thing stupider than the stupid rules are the people following them. And this really becomes the question to us. When the biggest mistake that we can make is to accept that the way things are is the way things have to be. When it falls down to us, when leadership has let us down, when the strategy isn't right, are we willing to break the rules if we're going to set out to remake the rules? And this is the question I ask in the book, and, and I, I point to the pirate code because the pirates had this code. It was a law, uh, and it demonstrates these values, these values of equality. These values of fairness. And over the 35 years of the Golden Age of Pirates, these codes come up on every single crew. They had to have a pirate code. If we were going to go adventuring now, us crew were going to go and rob ourselves a boat and set out, we wouldn't get aboard until we'd signed our pirate code. Each and every single one of us signed up to a set of values and principles that were so profoundly held that we could make decisions upon them. We lack that. I haven't found an organization. Even the best organizations with their words written on the wall, you know, are almost instantly forgettable. I have a little policy of my own that every time I see trust written in seven foot letters inside any of my clients' walls, you should definitely not trust them. <laughs> these, were, these, were, these were values to stop being nouns but become adjectives. These didn't happen, you know, there was no wiki pirate where they could go and copy and paste. What's up, what do we stand for again? Um, and consistently throughout the different pirate codes, they return these standards that they fought for. So it's no wonder that over time they began to infiltrate culture. And so my question at the end of the book is really, is there a chance for a pirate code 2.0? Are there values? And I know it's a bit trite to skip 2.0 anyway, you're, you're totally right to skip 2005. But you know what I mean. Um, what are the values that we would be willing to fight for? 
Not the ones that we forget. Not the ones that we've trotted out 10 times. Not the ones that we signed up for in the beginning. But right now, 2018, facing the colossal mess that we do, what values would you fight for? And when I say fight, I mean fight. Would you take a bloody nose for? Would you give someone a bloody nose for? Would you risk your house for? Would you do what was required to begin the story of Melissa Forsyth for? What values would you actually, actually fight for? Suffer for? What values should we be organising ourselves around? Because the, the challenges we face are pretty well organised. More organised than we do in response to them. And so I put this question out into the world, not necessarily knowing the answer, and certainly not believing that anyone was going to listen, but I at least found a way to articulate all of my anger about the entire mess. Uh, and then something really remarkable happened. Well, firstly, I was told that the book didn't have any marketing budget, <laughs> which shouldn't be that remarkable, because I'm used to working with small budgets. Uh, and so I decided that I would do something about this myself. And I would rustle up some way of promoting this book that I put so much into. And I was giving a talk at Penguin, who, my publisher, a um, similar sized room, and at the back there's a window double the size. Now, my background, and I, I began my career in uh, nightclubs, putting on raves. And whilst I was looking at the crowd, all I could think was, wow, that window be amazing if I could fly for this trip. Because Penguin's office is on Vauxhall Bridge Road, so it looks out to six lanes of traffic between Vauxhall Bridge and Westminster. Imagine how many people go past this every day, I thought. Imagine if I could fly close to that. And you've seen the book, right, right think. Imagine if I could put, oh, imagine. So I went and found the building's uh, manager and asked him, and he literally chased me out of the building. Get to the way, this is a listed building, Westminster Council, you must be mad. Imagine everyone, if everyone, blah, 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 so I was chased out. And I began a little hack that I think is quite useful for all of us, you know, um, in these times. And it's a, it's a kind of simple way to start your rule-breaking career as pirates. When you hear no, and you don't agree, just pretend that you've heard go. <laughs> it doesn't work every time, but by and large, as a kind of rule of thumb, rule of thumb for aggressive innovation, professional rule-breaking 101. So I've applied this to the whole prints of the book. So he said no, I thought, okay, sorry, I thought you said go. So I went and got a quote for fly posting the window, massive vinyl banner. 1740 pounds, which was 1740 pounds more than I had. And then I was got a call from the chief exec of Penguin Random House, this guy called Tom Wealth. He's a really lovely man, he's led the business for a long time. I knew him in a previous life. He'd been a client of mine at, at Liberty, he'd done lots of work around youth university. Uh, and so he asked me my opinion, could I make for breakfast? I'd love to know what you think as an, as an entrepreneur becoming an author. You know, tell me what your reflections are on the publishing industry. Like, great, obviously I had loads. Um, so I told him a few points, and he said, well, that's great, would you come in and present that to our leadership team? And I said, yes, but you'll have to pay me a fee. <laughs> and he said, you do know we've just published your book. And I said, yes, but I need something for the campaign. And he said, mm, okay, how much? And I said, 1,740 pounds. <laughs> I said, well, that's very specific, what's it for? I said, I can't tell you. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I can't tell you. I then went away, ordered the banner, forged a letter from Tom Weldon, the chief exec of my publisher. Dear Sam, please take this as permission. Didn't think it through, there's loads of typos in it, his legs are like, obviously the CEO wouldn't have typos in it. Anyway, I uh, got that one through, went on Amazon, ordered five high-vis yellow vests, because you can get away with anything in my with yellow vest. I yeah. uh, got the thing measured up. The day of the book launch, me and the lads showed up with the vests on, with the clipboard, with the forge permission, and we installed a banner on the front of Penguin Random House's head office in the centre of London, the size of a root glass in shocking bright pink. <laughs> Nobody contested it. A few people took pictures. Uh, they went very, very quiet. I ran back to Liberty at Brixton and went to the Trinity, public, uh, Trinity Arms public house down the road. Um, it was very quiet for the next couple of hours. Then a few pictures popped up on social media from some of the younger recruits of Penguin. I teed up about 20 different people who've got big followings and I've written a couple of articles about it, hoping that that would kind of stimulate some noise. Lunchtime was really, really scary, but by mid-afternoon it started to pick up and then there was some traction behind it. Late afternoon it started to really kick off and there was quite a lot of excitement behind it. Four, five o'clock in the afternoon, Richard bloody Branson retweets the thing. Weirdly kind of taking credit for it, but you know, whatever. Uh, 
and then it just goes through the roof. It just becomes, goes viral. The story goes fantastically uh, well. Everybody's talking about it. I'm inundated with calls and messages. And the book hits the top 100 of all books in the UK. By 7 o'clock, it's number 81. And un, I mean, there's literally about 300 books out every single week. There was 500 all out last week on the run up to Christmas. Uh, 80 of the top 100 are Joe Wicks. I mean, there's the sheer volume involved in this is extraordinary. So to be in the top 100, I got a begrudging call of congratulations from Tom Weldon. Well done. I'll take it down. <laughs> uh, and so it continued. Suddenly I realized I've said this, I've said this out loud. I've said that sometimes we need to do things differently and that means putting your neck on the line, sometimes to prove there's a better way of doing things. Sometimes my understanding of the most rules, and the more I've looked at this, the more I read the book, the more I read the book, the more I wrote the book, everyone I asked, rules seem to be from three places. Apart from the regulations, right? So we'll put regulations to one side because I don't really want anyone to get nicked. But if we put that to the side, rules come from three places. Uh, perspective. Someone knows something more than I do, so I'll do what they say. Power, the boss told me. Precedent, that's the way it was done. I can't find another source for the rules of these things. And every single time I've found a really profoundly stupid rule within an industry, within a sector or an organization, I've tried to follow it back up the line. Until you get to anybody relatively senior, and they're like, well, yeah, that's ridiculous. Why would you do it like that? So then calling these things out made me realize that you can set new rules. Even though we feel powerless at times within our organizations, and that is the way things are done, it's just as easy, and that's not easy, to set new perspectives, to be the expert, to demonstrate your power by having a group of us together, or by setting new precedents. And so I've lived that in every single way I could. The most successful thing I've done to promote the book was to go with the number one platform that I was told I wasn't allowed to go near. They're called Blinkist. They do every single non-fiction book uh, succinctly put down into a couple of minutes. The publishing industry views them as the biggest threat. In fact, I was told they're the Spotify of publishing book. To which I said, you do know what you just said there, don't you? Um, and so I called them up, and the only author that's ever called them, they said, you do know who we are? I said, yes, absolutely, I want to write the synopsis. Um, and so we had a global launch, which would have just been a UK launch through their platform. Uh, the, the day I got the US deal was a week before Donald Trump was visiting. One of the pirates who read the book just got in touch with me saying he has a, a 20,000 lumen projector. So I got the high-vis vest back out and projected a huge picture of Donald Trump and Theresa May on the side of Parliament saying the wrong pirates are in charge. I think I got in trouble for that. Um, uh, I discovered that Waterstones and W.H. Smith weren't behind me. They didn't see the book as they, they couldn't quite work out where to place it. They just hadn't really bought it. They hadn't looked into it. They hadn't read it. They just couldn't categorize it. So that frustrated me. So I took my bag full of books and went down and started redecorating the, the shops and put them on the shelves exactly where they should be. I managed to break into the front of the uh, Waterstones flagship store and make my own window display. <laughs> um, I did everything I possibly could to make a point to prove that the book had momentum, to prove that there was something in this message that I believed in, and it worked. I gathered a following. In fact, the book has been a bestseller for six months, ever since it was released in May. On the back of all, I can track every single purchase that's gone through. I've run my own shop, I've had to become an independent bookseller. I've had to do every single thing that I was told I couldn't do to prove this bloody point. And it's not just a proven bloody point. I'm not here to say that I'm right. I'm here to say that this book's smart. I and mean, in fact, incredibly anxious and uh, unwilling author. I found the whole thing somewhat terrifying. I thought I was leaving liberty to have more time with my daughters, and actually this is the busiest I've ever been. I'm very torn. I'm torn for this final part of the story. A couple of weeks after the launch of the book, the response that I was most hoping for, that I least believed, began to happen. And I received an email that went something like this. Dear Sam, thank you very much for your book. It's really inspired me. I've just handed in my notice. Here is my resignation letter. Forwarded me a resignation letter. Inspired by this point that really change is only going to come from any of us. I said, what? <laughs> I didn't mean it. <laughs> Except, of course, I did. And the next day I received another one. Uh, Dear Sam, thank you very much. Your book has really inspired me. I've decided to leave my corporate cushy job and I'm going to begin my social enterprise that I've always dreamed of. And now, I'm like, yeah, well, the world doesn't need people like cashing in and corporate jobs. The world does need more professional social enterprises. Yeah. The next day another, the next day another, the next day another. 
on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on my email, every single where I seem to turn, there was another message. Another guy has decided he's going to start a campaign on the high street against the betting industry for the terrible issue about fixed rate odds, and he's going to fuck up the machines with expanding foam. I tried to talk him down. Over here, I had a young woman whose best friend had been held at Yarl's Wood illegally for three months, and she'd read the book and so on the back of the book. She'd worked out a campaign to get her friend released. I then got completely involved in that one, and we saw her friend not only be released, but get indefinite leave to remain. And it continued, and the thing that I was going to show you a whole bunch of them. The, the, most, uh, the most common place for them to come from was, was our world, our sector, from the care sector, who'd been using Be More Pirate as a framework, from the housing sector, from social housing sector, from education, from frustrated healthcare professionals, from, uh, from hospital trusts, from schools, from universities, where the rules are so, so, where we know it could be and should be so much better, where the real appetite for innovation is so far from us and we feel so duty-bound to do things the way they've always been done. That is where the greatest shout and, and, and rising up of rebels has come from. And I have not been able to keep pace with it at all. This week I got the 401st, uh, and I have a folder in my Gmail. There's just under 20,000 books have been sold. The fifth edition is going to go to print next week, um, which is extraordinary in book terms. Um, in my I've got no way of measuring this, right? My best guess is that's a 2% return on rebellion rate. Right? Which doesn't sound bad. I mean, if it was an on-pack promotion, that would be really good. I don't know where that goes. I've got back to about maybe 100 of them, because I didn't believe it. I honestly didn't believe it. The summary of them all is, you have articulated frustrations that I feel so sharply that I now feel able to act on them. They're not asking for help, they're not asking for money. They're just joining in. So I began to realize what I should be doing here is, is rising to this, but I'm terrified of it. What the fuck have I done? You know, it, we all feel the same. I didn't want to start something. I didn't mean to start something. I wouldn't have written this book if I thought anyone like I had, if I thought anyone was going to read it. Then I got another email. I said, Dear Sam, I must call bullshit on you. I read your book and I'm really inspired to action. I signed up to your community and it's rubbish. I've got one kind of funny email uh, and that's it. Where's the community? If you don't start it, I will. She created an event bike for a first London meetup. And they got another one. Dear Sam, I'm an investor. The rule that I'm going to break is I'm no longer going to give money to charity this year, I'm going to give it to you. Only on the basis that you hire a community manager, because you are not fulfilling the opportunity that you've begun. So yesterday that job post went live. The first meetup is in January. I'm even more scared. It looks out in the USA in, uh, in a few weeks, then Russia, and then across Europe. No idea quite where this goes. The one condition of being awarded this money is to make sure that the good trouble that I advocate in the book stays good. How I hold on to that yet, I don't truly know. But what I do know, this line, this line that I was willing to tell my daughter to write a book for, to take her to town for, to present her this notion that sometimes doing the wrong thing is the right thing to do. It's not just a thought that I have. And we are in historic times. We might not all want to be statues, but by God, we do need to know that we are ready to break the rules when the time comes. That book, thank you very, very much indeed. but that was the best possible way for me certainly to finish our two days there was so much in that so many um, really relevant really resonant messages and what you're going to begin to try and reflect on them except that i don't know about the rest of you i'm not sure how much you know about Madka and the people here today but the thing that really stood out for me in all of that apart from all those fantastic messages was the power a really small network joining together to challenge the big guys. And is there a better message for us to take home with us after the two days we've just had, talking about forging community and the role of local social action in doing that? So on that note, thank you so much, Sam. We're very, very privileged that you've been able to join us. I'm delighted to say that we actually have copies of his book for you to take with you. That's part of your ticket price. So thank very much for that indeed. I'm sure we'll be very keen to hear more about the community. We're good on communities, we like communities. 
I'm going to wrap it up at that point. Please, if I may ask you, if you haven't already, put in your evaluation cuts. They're really easy. It's got one question, yes or no. But it does mean an awful lot to us to help to know whether or not you've enjoyed the two days. I must say, before they start disappearing to do things, a really, really big thank you to the team. So Pauline and Anna and Amanda and Tom and Julianne, I don't know where Julianne is, but she's there. Um, I'm quite interested to think about putting into the staff objectives the principle of getting nearly fired once a year. But I'm going to have a conversation with our new chair before I decide that one, because that might be a bit curiosity from my point of view. Thank you all so much for coming. It's been a fantastic couple of days from our point of view. I hope you've enjoyed it. Safe journeys home. For those of you that needed a taxi booking, the taxis will be outside any moment now. Um, and this time next year, we'll be back. Don't know where yet, don't know what we're going to call it, but get it in your diaries because it'll be the same way for next year. Thank you very much indeed.